Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Today we're looking at the FA-18C Hornet and it's AN APG-73 Airborne Air-to-Air -air Radar in BVRU. So, our Hornet radar is split into two, air-to-ground and air-to-air. -air. From air-to-air, -air, it's split into two again, ACM and BVR. ACM, Air Combat Maneuvers, these are modes suitable for if your enemy is 10 miles or closer. BVR, suitable for if your enemy is 10 miles or further away. Yes, in reality, these two do overlap each other, but that's the general rule of thumb. ACM, covered in a different video, I will link below, and air to ground, covered in a different video. So what we're looking at today is air to air, BVR, and its various sub modes. Prerequisite is that you, the viewer, understand modern Pulse Doppler air to air radars. If you don't, then to be honest, this is just gonna be Chinese. We do have starter videos to help people into airborne radars and for instance I will link in the video description our F-16 equivalent of this video where we spend about 10 minutes just about the simplicities and the basics. We're not going to do the basics in this video and this will be a very complex video. We're not covering in-depth IFF. The reason is it's already covered in a big hour-long IFF and data link video which again I will link below. We will however make some references to it. We're not going to cover data link and MSI, multi-sensor integration. Now in a modern jet a radar is not just a radar, it's linked with all sorts of other sensors. For instance my radar will also be linked to the data link so it will have information coming in from an AWACS, from other radars on other planes in our flight and so on. Again I've got a full 16 minute video explaining MSI and data link and again that video will be linked below. Also no weapons deployment that it's fully covered in our weapons deployment videos we're just looking at the basic radar and how the different locks and tracks work there's no point of going into our aeroplane and start pressing buttons and twiddling switches without understanding the basics of how the hornet radar deals with bvr so it's essentially got three sub modes rws range while search RWS with the addition of LTWS, so that's range while search with latent track while scan, and TWS track while scan. So that's a search mode, that's a search mode, that's a search mode. From each of these three search modes, we can come out with a final product, and that final product is going to be a track. So from our range while search, we can only get one type of track, an STT, a single target track, which gives us by default an L and S. An L and S is launch and steering. This means that it gives launcher steering information to us, the pilot, for how to fire a missile on this target. A single target track means that we are concentrating all of our radar's energy on that one target and nothing else. It's the most pure form of target track. And this type of target track will support firing of an AIM-7 and an AIM-120 in BVR. Next is range war search with the addition of latent track while scan. The first thing is, my apologies, I've, I just realized I've written this wrong, that this with this mode here, you can also get an STT. That is a function that you can get as well. But you can also have additional tracks. So as well as STT, or I should say instead of STT, we can get the following. We can view the track file. We can interrogate the track file, find out information about it for our situational awareness. But this will not give us any fire support for weapons. In addition to viewing the track file, we can generate an LNS, launch and steering. Again, under latent track while scan, RWS, we've got no fire support for the actual mission. And our designator for this will be a star. So just remember, star is launch and steering. And in addition to that, and that, we can have a DT2, a designated target two, a secondary target. The LNS is always the primary. The DT2 is always the secondary. We cannot fire weapons on it. And its designation sign is a diamond. Now, these guys here, that one and that one, while under RWS LTWS, is known officially, I believe, in the Hornet as soft lock or soft locking, if you want to make it into a verb. Third mode, track or scan. We're dealing with tracks and bricks and hits. We can get, again, all of these three modes can have an STT, and this STT is identical to that STT, which is identical to this STT. Or we can have basically the same as we've got here for the RWS and LTWS. We can have view a track file, a single one, I should say. You can't view more than one track file. That's no fire support. In addition to the viewing a track file, again, we can get an LNS, a launch and steering, and a designated target two, primary and a secondary target. The difference with track file scan, and I don't know the physics behind this, so you guys will have to tell me, you can have fire support for the AIM-120 with an LNS and a DT-2 under track file scan. Same designations, star and diamond. Here is today's mission and this mission is available in the video description. I've, I've uploaded it and you can download it there so you can do exactly the same as me. Here is my F-18 here 
And when I go into the cockpit, I'm going to put it on active pause so that I do not move, only the hostiles move. And the good thing about the hostiles is they're just going back and forwards along a con constant conveyor belt. So you can just sit here for three hours in your F-18, not moving, practicing your radar. It's the best thing to do. We've got a whole bunch of Tu-95s, all at different altitudes, just going east to west. Two of them are mixed in for friendlies, even though we're not really going to look much at IFF today. We've also got a group here of four of them that are very close to each other, and that's going to allow us to show some expand and raid functions off in our radar. Also note, we have waypoint one, and I apologise, it's not showing for some reason, but take my word for it, we've got waypoint one, and it is over our mission bullseye there, and that's a very important thing to take note of. Our waypoint one is over our mission bullseye. First thing is to get everything set up. We're going to make sure master arm is on, we're going to hide our stick by clicking on it, right control papa removes this guy here for clear revision. Ensure that our radar is set to operational. We're going to select a missile. I'm going to choose an AMRAM. We're not firing missiles today, but it will help us describe some extra information. We've selected an AMRAM there. And I'm going to put that back to there temporarily. Next, we're going to get our attack radar. So we're going to go to the tactical menu here. Attack radar. First thing I want to explain, even though we're not looking at data link and third party information sources, is that we can interpolate radar information along with geographical information. Over to the HSD, to get there, we would go to this menu here, HSI. We're gonna to turn to waypoint one and turn our waypoint on there. So our waypoint one, we're gonna turn into essentially our mission bullseye. We're gonna to go to data and we are going to go to, with this number one selected, air to air waypoint. We've now converted waypoint one into an air to air waypoint, otherwise known as a bullseye waypoint. Now we can have many waypoints in here, only one of them can have this box checked on, so only one of them can be the mission's bullseye. And the reason I explained earlier why that waypoint has to be over the actual mission bullseye is because it's now representing the mission bullseye on our radar screen. So if we were now to zoom out here, we can see that we have a diamond with an arrow pointing to north. That is our bullseye. And out of interest, if we chose a different waypoint there, then the bullseye waypoint stays, but it's now a circle, again, pointing north. So this gives us a geographical representation of where the bullseye is. Now, note that with this bullseye waypoint in play here, this here is a bra, a bearing range altitude from us, our own ship, and we are basically sitting there pointing that way, to the TDC, wherever this TDC is. And we can move that round like that, and you can see that is going to change. So from there to there is that bra. Also, from the waypoint there, or the bullseye to TDC, is that up there, 153 for 40.6 nautical miles. And if I went to start selecting targets, it would then change. It would then, this up here would then be from bullseye to that particular target. And that means that we can communicate information with the bullseye referenced to other team members. We can say that my current ship is 22148 from the bullseye. My TDC where I'm looking is here from the bullseye. This target over here is here from the bullseye. Then everyone in our flight or whoever we're talking to knows exactly where that guy is in reference to a common point. Next we need to look at today's controls and so to slew things around and move things up and down left and right with the TDC we're gonna have TDC up down there and right. To lock onto a target TDC depress. If we want to either undesignate a track or switch between tracks depending on which mode we're in again undesignate there. To transport it interrogate sensor control switch depress. To ensure that our TDC is assigned to this screen here so that we can actually manipulate it, which will be shown by having that diamond in it there, so it's already assigned, we will want SCS right. So before you try and use this radar, ensure it's assigned a TDC. Before we look at the three modes and how to interact with targets, we've got to explain everything. This here is our B scope. This is zero miles from us. This is quarter, half, three quarters, and full, as opposed to this what we've got here. Uh, amount of miles. So it's currently 80, 60, 40, 20, 0. And we can change that from 5 all the way up to 160. This is a range scale. Once we get past the top range, we get in this box here. This is called the dugout. If one of these bricks here, for some reason we didn't have his range, only his azimuth, then it would be in the dugout up here. This is our 12 clock position. This is off to our left. And this is off to our right. In terms of our azimuth, this is the limit of our scan zone. And this is the right limit of our scam zone. Radar antenna goes left and right between the bump stops. 140 degrees is the maximum setting. The actual antenna position, as it is at the moment, is shown by this thing called a B sweep line. That is where our actual antenna is sweeping at any one time. The way it works is when the B sweep goes over the target here, they will appear. 
and then they have a refresh rate at a certain point these will disappear again and we can change that refresh rate or erase rate as we'll see later so if this b-sweep is showing the current antenna azimuth then this elevation carrot here this little v is showing the antenna elevation it's currently moving up and down in terms of bars each of those bars is 1.3 degrees of coverage it is centered around a center point and with the following buttons i can actually move that up and down so i can move it up and hit the bump stop there down and hit the bump stop there next is our tdc cursor this is how we manipulate things and we can move it about with the tdc left right up and down if we wanted to do something with one of these targets we would put the tdc on them and press the equivalent button note that it has a number at the top and the bottom and this is best described as the scope of scannable elevation at this range so if we're there the tdc is there the range of the tdc is 50 miles so at 50 miles from me the coverage of our actual scannable zone is at the top plus 20,000 feet at the bottom plus 7,000 feet look what happens now when I change the elevation center point of our radar minus 60,000 feet to minus 70,000 feet you know over the top there 87 73 and note because it is a divergent scan zone it gets bigger as it gets away the numbers get bigger there and smaller there and therefore the scope gets larger as we move away and vice versa if we want to change the elevation coverage of our radar we change it in terms of bars remember each bar is about 1.3 degrees it changes with the range here but 1.3 is near enough we can have four bars six bars and this shows the current bar that it's scanning which will coincide with the elevation carrot there and next we're going to show the azimuth coverage so we're currently covering an azimuth of 140 degrees if we wanted less coverage we could go 20 40 60 about to 80 and 140 now no, if you go 20 the bump stops are now essentially set there and there and our b-sweep is just scanning that area there and some targets will disappear 40 a bit bigger and some more targets will appear and so on so at this point you're thinking well why don't you always have 140 degrees and six bars surely the most elevation and the widest azimuth coverage would always be best and that is i must admit how i used to think and that is how it would work in a game but in a simulator like this where real physics are taken into account unfortunately that doesn't work what will happen if you have that large amount of bars and the 140 degree scan is that the time it takes for the b-sweep to do left right left right left right every time it goes left up or down a bar then it goes another sweep and then it goes up or down a bar and another sweep by the time you'd actually scanned a target in to see him again what we call the refresh rate is too low and we couldn't actually maintain tracks and do the things we want to do we'll just have some basic situational awareness so for instance a typical format for me would be 40 that's what I'll be using to fight stuff. It gives me a nice quick refresh rate, which is absolutely essential. And I'll be on four bars. Uh, four bars is a decent compromise between height of scan, elevation of scan, and the refresh rate. Next, we're going to look at silent. And this basically just stops the radar. It stops it emitting. So I'm going to turn back to 140 because it just shows it better. I'm going to stop it there. I've pressed silent. It's now boxed. The antenna is now stuck in place at this point i can force it to do a full four bar sweep so that's left and right four times basically in total by pressing active so let's go and watch it do its four bar sweep be two left two right and then it will terminate again if i turn this off i can use the arrays the arrays will immediately erase the bricks or the hits that we've got shown here if you wanted to do that for some reason so the first repopulate first of all it will take a few minutes uh, seconds to repopulate because we've got four bars to scan so now if i press erase here they're gone until they're found again by the radar and they're gone until they're found again by the radar and so on or we can raise and then silent and you can have mixtures of arrays active and silent next is the state of the radar it's currently operational it could be standby next is our aircraft's current magnetic heading that can be changed to true in the hsi next is our current weapon which is an aim 120c and we have four of them here is the tdc assignment marker as we saw earlier here is the current display range from base to there we've seen already that we can go up and down in scale the next is going to be set this is a really useful feature this allows us to save certain radar settings to a certain weapon i really like four bar i really like 40 degrees i really like uh, 40 miles so with the uh, amram selected i'm going to press set it's now saved that information to the amram i'm now going to change my weapon to something else doesn't matter what it is okay nine x and i'm going to scramble all of my settings now i'm going to go back to my amram 
and it brings all of my save settings from the set. Next is reset and reset basically releases any type of track that you have currently at the moment. Now, I don't have any tracks at the moment, so it's not gonna do anything, but we will come to look at that and its function a little bit later on. Next is NCTR, non-cooperative target recognition. This is much more tied in with IFF, so we're just gonna breeze over it. It's modal, so it's either on or it's off, and all it means is that if we get an STT lock, as we'll show you later on, and the target is in within parameters, i.e. within 25 nautical moles of us, and within 30 degrees left or right, hot, or 30 degrees left or right, cold, then our radar can scan his plane and determine which type of aircraft it is, and therefore which coalition it is. The aircraft type will be reported down the bottom here, and its coalition will be reported through the usual IFF process. But remember, it's only one form of IFF identification, or it is a two-factor authentication-based aircraft. Next, we've got our angels here, our barometric altitude. We've got our speed, CAS, calibrated airspeed. We've got our MAC there. Next is going to be data. That's complex, so we'll come back to that in a second. Channel, currently not functional, December 2019. That takes us back to main menu mode not functional 2019. This here is our PRF. So we can switch between medium, high, and interleave. Interleave simply means that it will switch between medium and high automatically. So based on your pursuit type, you're gonna choose medium or high, or whether you want it interleaved. I personally just leave it interleaved, but the better pilots out there will be swapping that for high and medium. Radar pry currently non-functional and not explained in the manual. You can see here that we've got RWS selected and we would press that to toggle between RWS and TWS. So next let's go to data. What we've got first is declutter and there are two types of declutter and a non-declutter. So that's non-declutter. That adds us our horizon line and which way is up and down and our velocity vector and this is gonna help us fly. Declutter one takes away some things, declutter two takes away even more things. Data just takes us back out to the main radar screen Latent track while scan. By pressing this on and it's modal, we now got the second radar type. It is now range while search with latent track while scan. Note that by default in an aircraft, latent track while scan will be on. MSI is modal and it just means, do we want multi-sensor integration? Do we want extra information to come into us, be displayed on this screen from the AWACS, from an EWR, from radars on our other aircraft. In this case, ticking it or not ticking it won't make any difference because in my example, there is no AWACS, there is no data link, there are no other sensors apart from my radar. Color is modal. Do we want color to be shown? Color dictates different states of enemy IFF recognition. Red, bad, green, a goodie, yellow and unknown and so on. And I go through it fully in the IFF and data link video. Uh, RAID one look, currently not functional. Bra is simply whether we want to show the bra or not, it's modal. LDF, currently not functional. Norm is our pulse Doppler speed gate. So obviously pulse Doppler radars work with a notch filter and you can increase or decrease the size of that notch filter. So with Norm, the notch filter is smaller. It's gonna be essentially harder for, if you like, a hostile plane to notch you. If it press it, turn it to wide, then the gate is gonna be enlarged. It's gonna be easier for a plane to notch you, a hostile plane to notch you, but it's also gonna be easier for us to see, for instance, slow moving things like a helicopter. Very hard to see without your wide Doppler gate on. Currently not actually functional, but it will be implemented and that's how it will work. ECCM, electronic counter countermeasure. So if this guy up here turned his jammer on and using his ECM, we could counter that and that basically puts the radar in a mode where we can see him easier if he is noise jamming, but it will unfortunately reduce the effectiveness of the overall radar. Again, late 2019, it's not working, but that is how it will work. And finally on this page, we've got our refresh rate. Very important, currently set to four seconds. It means once this B-sweep has pinged to highlighted a target, how many seconds before that disappears? And you can imagine if the B-sweep went over that target less than what we've got set here, we'd have all sorts of problems. Targets would be disappearing, tracks wouldn't be able to be maintained. It's important to understand the relationship here between refresh rate, or erase rate, I think is actually the correct name, the amount of bars we're scanning, and the azimuth. They all have to work together. So I could change it to, 8 seconds, 16 seconds, 32 seconds, 
2 seconds and 4 seconds. So we're finishing data here. We're going to turn latent track wall scan off so we can look at a little closer our first mode, which is the pure range wall search with no LTWS. So in the basic range wall search mode, there's not a lot we can do. We can't do any track file interrogation. All we can do is put our TDC over a guy, press the TDC depress once, and then we get that. So now we've got the first type of track we're looking at today, the STT. Now the B-sweep is just staying still. That's because the antenna is now just staring at that guy there. We get extra information. We get his altitude here. And this here is the target's MAC. Now that seems a bit high at the moment for a TU-95. That's because when we're in active pause like we are at the moment, the, the speeds don't work properly. It's just a um, restriction of this. If I went off active pause, it would go down to a sensible speed. We have a closure rate here. I think it flashes, but there is a, uh, a number that comes here and shows we're closing at so many knots. This here has changed. So this is now a bra from bullseye to the hostile. RTS is over RWS. So this means now we can return, press this here and we can RTS, we can return to scan if we want to get out of this STT. We've also got TWS up here, which means we can switch from the range wall search STT to TWS, although the STT won't be maintained, the L and S will. And that's another thing I should maybe come on to now is that because we've got an STT on this guy, we've also got L and S launch and steering. Uh, that's shown here. We've got an ASE circle, allowable steering error with a steering dot there. So it's telling us with this particular weapon, whatever we've got an AMRAM selected, I need to maneuver if I want to fire properly so that that steering dot is in that ASE circle and that computes for lead for the missile and stuff like that. As well as that, part of our L and S is that we've got ranging information. Now in other aircraft, this would be known as a dynamic launch zone. In this aircraft, it's known as launch accessible region. You can see the maximum firing range of my missile is there. The minimum range of my missile is going to be there. And the no escape range is going to currently be merged with the maximum. And you can see he's tens of miles away because he is whatever his range is and i guess the last thing to notice is that we have part of his hafu here hafu hostile ambiguous friendly or unknown this is part of the iff and data link system it's covered thoroughly in our data link video what we're going to do now is undesignate and return to search the way i'm going to do that is pressing the undesignate button press undesignate we go back to search and, and let's just do that again just to show we can um it can be hard to STT on guys that are moving away. And you can see these guys are clearly moving away. So I might not be able to get an STT on this guy. We'll just try. So I'm pressing there, TTC, depress. Uh, we actually did manage to do that. Probably because they're big planes. And undesignate again. And we're back there. The next thing I want to quickly show is an IFF interrogation. So I'm going to STT this guy here. I'm pretty sure he's going to be a friendly. And he's too far away for NCTR. So I'm just going to press the SES depress to interrogate his transponder for one factor of authentication. Let's try that. And you can see his transponder came back with a squawk of friendly and he is now shown as a dome. So I've shown how very basically to IFF a guy you've got in an SDT lock there. Let's undesignate. Let's move on to range wall search with latent track wall scan. So now a lot of stuff is automated and I can get more information. So if I were to move my cursor over a guy you see we can assess his track and i've not logged him i'm just assessing his track file i can see that his angel is 12.6 is mac one and he's considered number one in the priority as well as that it will automatically iff this guy when i do this so it's got him as yellow in this case because he is an unknown Let's try another guy that guy is automatically iff him it's domed him it's got him as five in the priority angel 17 mac 1.1 another guy uh, got his Mac and his speed and his three in the priority and so on. Uh, I've never quite been sure how it formulates the priority list, but I believe it's threat based and the guy nearest to us and hottest and whatnot is going to be at the high end of the priority and the guy at the low end of the priority is going to be generally further away or a bomber or something like that. It's a bonus of latent track file scan. When we are interrogating a track file, we get this, but that is not actually the same thing as an LNS launch and steering. There's no steering information here for the weapon. It's purely the range of our current weapon. And we can only interrogate one track at a time also it shows us their vector as well that's a bonus of this track file is that we can show their vector there their vector there the vector there the next thing we're going to do is i like one of those guys and we're going to press the tdc to press that is going to go and bug him or soft lock him i'm gonna i'm gonna soft lock this guy here 
We can tell that he is our primary target, and we know that because he's got the star, and the official name is LNS, Launch and Steering. We're arranging information there, steering information here. This, All this information here is duplicated up in the HUD in terms of weapons specific info, but we're not going to look at that today. Now at this point, it differs how we can no longer RTS, return to search up here. If we wanted to completely untrack this guy, this is a form of trackless LNS, we would have to now reset. So if I wanted to get out of here, back to standard, Reset would be how we do it. Now, if we actually pressed undesignate button in this mode, range roll scan with LTWS, undesignate actually selects as a target. And it's going to select a target as an LNS in the priority list. One, two, three, four, five, or whatever. So let's cycle through them. Undesignate, 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 undesignate and so on. Note that it's got the top part of the Hafu and the Vector and whatnot. Next, we can track an additional target. We can get our DT2. With that guy as LNS, we're gonna get this guy over here as our DT2. Hyper over him, TDC depress. He's now our DT2. Remember, diamond, DT2, star, LNS. And I can now toggle between them with the undesignate button, like that. And in addition, I can interrogate track files up to one track file, there. So now we are tracking him with LNS, primary target. Tracking him, DT2, secondary target. Interrogating him, who's actually now priority one outside of the LNS and the DT2. And that's the most we can interrogate in terms of this. Now, like I said, in range roll scan, latent track scan, we can't employ weapons on these guys. It's purely for gaining our situational awareness. It helps me see what these guys are doing, which way they're going. Now, a lot of this will be superseded if we're having MSI, if we're having AWACS information come into our data link, because it'll tell us a lot of this without us having to mess around and do this. But if we didn't have that data link and the MSI, then this is how we're going to find information about these guys. Now we can't undesignate because remember undesignate button doesn't do this. It will just swap between these guys here. So now if I want to undesignate, I've got to press reset. So that's showing the functionality of range roll search, the functionality of range roll search with latent trackball scan. All we've got now is the third mode, which is trackball scan. So I'm going to move off that guy. I'm going to press the button here. And we've got track our scam. The first thing to understand is that there are some more restrictions in terms of our azimuth and our bars on our refresh rate. Basically, with track while scan, the radar can cover less area. Just because of how it works, it's doing more work. And if it's going to do more work in track while scan, it can't cover the same amount of area. So if I start pumping up the amount of bars here, it actually restricts me for my azimuth here. It doesn't do that on range while search. That's a big difference. If we went to one bar or two bars, whatever the lowest is. I can go all the way up to 80, I think it is. But if I go to six bars, I can only go up to 20, but hardly any scannable area. Next thing to look at is how we choose where the scan zone is. Bearing in mind our scan zone is now very small, we're going to have to have a bit more control. So we've got auto, manual and bias here. So manual is our standard. And all we do is move the TDC and this 20 degrees azimuth scan follows wherever I go. And bearing in mind I've got no MSI, therefore these guys are just going to disappear after the uh, refresh rate I've set of four seconds put them back and of course they come back auto means that and this might not work here auto means that it is based around the target that i've got tracked i haven't actually technically got any targets tracked at the moment per se if i've got an lns or i've got a dt2 it would be based around that and there's a final mode bias mode i never really understood the point of this but i will show you if i now put my tdc cursor out here and press tdc uh, depress it now biases this here the radar to that area there so i want to be able to move my cursor wherever i want but i only want the radar search scan to be there back to manual and get full control other than that we have a filter here hits uh, hits is another word for bricks and if i it's not going to show any difference here because we don't have any hits on the screen but we can filter them off like that now with the tws mode we can have up to what we call 10 this is going to differ from range roll search up to 10 filed targets. These guys are filed targets. They are targets that we can interrogate and have get information from and they're also prioritized number one up to ten. Again the prioritization is threat based. If there are more targets on the screen than just these ten they will not appear as filed targets. They will not be in the priority list. They will be just basic bricks or hits like we saw in the first mode just the pure RWS. All you've got is little um, square bricks. So let's start interacting. First of all a bit like latent track while scan. If I move my cursor over anything but don't press anything I get his Mac, his altitude, his direction, his priority number, and I've also got this launch accessible region here, otherwise known as dynamic launch zone to me, so ranging of the missile, but it's not an L and S, we've got no launch or steering information. So if we want to start tracking these guys for weapons scenario, there are different ways of doing this. First I'm going to press undesignate, and what this is going to do is cycle, I press it once, 
And you see what it's done is turned priority one into our LNS. And you can see we've got our ranges here and our steering information here. We can now go and deploy a weapon on that guy there. And I can cycle through by keep pressing on designate, cycle to the next guy, cycle to the next guy, cycle to the next guy. And we shoot. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of guys up there. We're cycling. Let me just try and get rid of them. And back to the first guy there. And what we could do is LNS him, fire a weapon. LNS him, fire a weapon. LNS him, fire a weapon. You could have all six or ten or whatever missiles going out at the same time. And like the latent track while scanning, range while search, I can now go and get a second guy, that guy there. Deep press again. And I've now got him in DT2, designated target 2. I can now switch between DT2 and this guy here, who we've just lost because he's gone out of our radar scan area. That's a problem. And these are typical things that would happen. Right, they went out because I moved my cursor over here, which, because this was on manual, took the B sweep over here, and I lost these guys, and I lost the tracks. My fault. So next I'm going to go to auto. And I'm actually going to, what I'm going to do is change up a bit here. Give us a bit more scannable zone. Go to auto. Right, let's try again. TDC deep press, LNS. TDC deep press, DT2. And I can swap between them with the undesignate button. He's now LNS. He's now DT2. So that's another way that we can launch weapons on this guy and this guy here. If we just wanted a pair to cycle through, we can do it like that. Again, if we want to undesignate completely, you can't press undesignate button. You're going to press to reset, so I'm going to reset. Note that even though I've reset, I've still got my LNS. But what it does do is reset LNS back to the original priority one target. So if I unpause, I cycle through to that target over there. He is now priority one. If I press reset, it's going to reset my LNS to that priority target. Watch this. That's now him as our LNS. And we just lost contact with him for reasons. Maybe it's turning, something like that. The next thing I want to do is show the raid and expand functions. And the whole idea of them is to, if you like, zoom in on an area. I've got four targets there flying in formation. I can't possibly manipulate them with a the TDC out here. I need to zoom in on them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to make them LNS first of all. I'm going to try and just grab one of them. There we go. So we're going to press raid here. And what that's done is it's changed now to 10 miles view. So that's 10 miles centered around our four ship here. We've now got the ability to go out with our TDC and actually pick on individual ones. If I clicked on expand, which I've just lost, so let me get out of raid. If I click expand, I should say this is centered around our LNS. It's all about the LNS here. Then it's done the same thing. 10 miles from there to there, but there is a marked difference. What's different is the way the radar works. Look at the, L of the azimuth B-sweep here in expand mode. It's still scanning. And now uh, go to raid instead. Note how the azimuth B sweep is now stuck in one area there. So a way we could think about it is that the raid zooms in and also changes how the radar works. It focuses that beam right on that area there. Whereas the expand mode zooms in the same in terms of view, but it also allows the B sweep to continue sweeping left. There's a subtle difference uh, of how that works. And you're going to have to choose which is uh, most relevant. I'm going to reset. We're back to our 80 mile scan or whatever we chose. We've got this guy as our LNS and the rest of our priority. If we want to go back to RWS, we've got our RWS there. The only other thing I could mention is that we are integrated with the RWR, the radar warning receiver. And you can see that we have nails here. So you can see we've got SU-34 radar being picked up here. We've got no distance range on them. So they'll always be kind of scattered at the top here. But that just shows one way of telling what type an airframe is by drawing a line from that to us and the plane that intercepts that line is going to be that, and uh, in this case an SU-34. That's all I can think of showing on the radar. I hope that was useful and see you later.